with uh, John, who's literally spoke this morning, raced back up to the Starship and raced back down again. Amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, kia ora koutou. Uh, thank you, Claire. Uh, so I'm John Bishop. I'm one of the Starship gastroenterologists, and I think I was meant to go before Andrew, so sorry, Andrew. Um, this was meant to be a, a, a double-headed talk, so I'll leave you to muse while I talk about what you might call a two-headed paediatric gastroenterologist. Um, as Claire said, I am on call for Starship, so if my phone goes, my excuse is I'm going to save children's lives. Reality is it might be just a, an escape hatch to get out of talking to such an esteemed, esteemed audience. Um, so, uh, I hope none of you have come across this conversation, but I suspect many of you have. Uh, so you've got celiac disease, uh, cut out gluten, you'll be fine. Uh, insert expletive of your own choice. Um, and clearly celiac disease is more complex and, uh, and more difficult than just cutting out something in the diet and going from there. Uh, and why is it more difficult? Well, it, celiac disease is a multi-system disease. Whilst uh, gastroenterologists like to think that the gut is the be-all and end-all, those of you who have experience of living with celiac disease know that it affects more than just the intestine. Uh, it may result in a number of medical complications and may be linked to other medical conditions. Uh, it's obviously a long-term illness and has effects on lifestyle, quality of life, family life, uh, relating to that and clearly whilst it may affect the individual it's something that impacts on the life of the whole family or, or wider community and uh, speaking to the converted here but it can it often incurs quite a significant financial burden to those in, uh, impacted so when we, when we talk about kind of a multi-system dis disorder clearly we're looking at uh, a condition that affects other body parts rather than just the gut. And I'm not going to go through this exhaustively because it would take a significantly longer time than I've been allocated and you'd all be snoozing. Uh, but I will go through a few of the areas that, inter uh, that celiac disease may affect. Uh, so I think uh, Andrew already alluded to this, um, but for those of you that don't know, dermatitis herpetiformis is uh, intrinsically linked with celiac disease with around 10% of people with celiac disease having this manifestation, although some studies suggest that up to 15 to 20 percent uh, may, may be affected. It's an extremely itchy, unpleasant rash that classically involves the elbows, the base of the spine, and sometimes the buttocks, and it's probably somewhat embarrassing to be having to wander around scratching your bum because of that. Um, obviously, this talk is kind of non-dietary therapies, and I have to say that introduction of a gluten-free diet does help with dermatitis herpetiformis, but it might take quite some time to work. So full effect may take up to two years. So many people do still require medical treatment or drug treatment to, to help with that as well. So the most common drug that's used is Dapsone. Uh, in, in other, um, in other uh, instances, Dapsone is a drug that is used to treat leprosy. Um, I hope you don't feel like lepers if you've got um, dermatitis herpetiformis. It can also be used to treat various forms of fungal infection. Um, it's a very effective treatment, so the itch often subsides within about three days of, tr of starting treatment, although you may require a, a fairly long course before it has full effect. Um, but like, like many medications, it requires some monitoring in terms of blood tests to make sure you're not running into side effects. Uh, if Dapsone doesn't work, then occasionally uh, other immune suppressant agents are used, such as steroids uh, or a variety of more potent immunosuppressants with their attendant issues relating to potential side effect profile and monitoring requirements. So not much fun. Um, uh, mouth ulcers, for those of you uh, who are prone to mouth ulcers, will be, as those will be aware, are pretty unpleasant and uncomfortable and are three times as common in those with celiac disease as in those in the general population. Introduction of a gluten-free diet does lessen the frequency of crops of mouth ulcers, but even so, they can be a little bit more uh, prevalent in people with celiac disease. Uh, and sometimes uh, additional treatment ab above and beyond a gluten-free diet may be required. That may be something as simple as mouthwashes with uh, antiseptic agents, antibacterial agents, or use of topical creams or ointments, for example, steroid creams or ointments. But very occasionally, if they're extremely problematic, more potent treatment may be required, including, including if you look in the medical literature, uh, reports of people using really quite potent immune suppressant agents uh, that, that are more commonly used for uh, more significant life-threatening autoimmune diseases. 
dental enamel defects uh, are not uncommon in the general population, but really much more prevalent in people with celiac disease. Uh, mild cases uh, don't often require significant uh, additional treatment, but are more a kind of minor cosmetic issue. But when you're getting really quite severe dental uh, impacts, including, uh, including uh, uh, effects affecting the strength and the shape of the teeth, then sometimes more uh, significant cosmetic dentistry is, 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 is required, including um, such measures as bonding or dental veneers or, or other cosmetic solutions. Uh, moving on to the medical complications, uh, we see kind of nutritional deficiencies uh, associated with celiac disease, most commonly at the time of presentation, but uh, may occur further on down the course of the disease. So anemia, most commonly, certainly in the pediatric age range, being due to iron deficiency, uh, will respond to a gluten-free diet as the bowel, as the bowel he, uh, wall will heal, but takes quite some time. And because of the impacts on uh, growth, on learning, on general well being, we tend to su su supplement with iron until the, the bowel wall is healed. Uh, other micronutrient deficiencies such as B12 and folate deficiency all also require some consideration and may require some specific, specific management. Uh, osteoporosis or bone health is understandably a cause for concern, particularly in older people with celiac disease and particularly in those who may also have other risk factors, uh, such as unfortunately being female, unfortunately being postmenopausal, maybe having a less, a more sedentary lifestyle or uh, having lifestyle factors that make you more at risk, such as smoking, alcohol use, um, etc. Uh, and clearly, osteoporosis can be a significant issue for particularly older people and put you at risk of fractures or significant pain and immobility as a result. Uh, and in, in and of itself, clearly we want to instigate a gluten-free diet, but osteoporosis may require specific treatments to strengthen the bones. Uh, Infertility may be a, a presentation in and of itself of celiac disease. So sometimes people come to the diagnosis because of fertility issues. And it's certainly clear that untreated celiac disease is related to subfertility in, in females. And uh, I was educated myself this morning, uh, a slight reduction in fertility in, in males as well who are, who are untreated celiac disease. As to whether or not if you're established on a gluten-free diet, that impacts on your fertility to a major extent, it remains a little bit debatable, but may have some impact. Uh, so uh, fertility issues may require specific consideration in, in women of, child of childbearing age. Uh, the, uh, in line with the mention earlier that celiac disease is a, is a multi-system disease, um, the uh, immune-mediated damage that affects the gut in celiac disease may also cause inflammation of the liver. Uh, so-called celiac hepatitis, which is not an infectious hepatitis like hep B or hep C, but more a kind of immune-mediated mediated inflammation of the liver, uh, is not uncommon in celiac disease. That does tend to respond to a gluten-free diet, but clearly if it's found it needs monitoring, which incurs the need for, for closer follow-up, for more frequent blood testing, uh, and for consideration of further investigations if it doesn't settle down. Uh, so it adds to complexity of treatment and burden of care for people involved. Uh, along with the directly kind of associated effects outside the gut, celiac disease is associated with a number of other conditions. So commonly it may be associated with other so-called autoimmune condition, uh, conditions, the most prevalent being type 1 diabetes. So around about 5 to 10% of people with type 1 diabetes may also have celiac disease. And conversely, a similar number of people with celiac disease may have type 1 diabetes. So the two uh, not uncommonly coexist. Um, as you can imagine, having both conditions adds a significant burden to your, to your medical needs and your requirement for care. And actually, from a practical viewpoint, it's hard enough adhering to a gluten-free diet, but also to having to adhere to a very healthy diabetic diet uh, makes life more, more challenging for people that are uh, troubled by both conditions. Uh, clearly, more medical follow-up is needed, more monitoring is needed, and there are risks of more long-term medical problems if you have diabetes 
diabetes in association with celiac disease. Uh, autoimmune thyroid disease is more common in people with celiac disease with a prevalence of around about three times that in the general population. And again, that adds to burden of care, as do, as do the coexistence of rarer autoimmune diseases like uh, Sjogren's disease, which is associated with uh, dry mouth and problems like that, and autoimmune liver disease, which uh, requires specific treatment. Uh, as well as the so-called medical conditions, um, celiac disease is a little bit more common in certain other diagnoses. So around about 5 to 10% of people with Down syndrome also have celiac disease, which adds to the healthcare needs of a population that already have significant uh, challenges related to healthcare and lifestyle. Uh, similarly, uh, Turner syndrome and Williams syndrome, which are, are rarer conditions, may also be associated with celiac disease, adding to the healthcare needs for that population group. The, the interaction and the association between celiac disease and mental health is an extremely interesting and, and probably a very complex one. Uh, and certainly it's well recognized that uh, mental health issues may, like fertility, be the presenting feature of celiac disease. So there may be a direct effect of the immune-mediated process on the mental health, or it may be a more subtle or, or complex interaction of an immune-mediated immune process, micronutrient deficiencies, chronic symptomatology, all of these things that interact on your mental well-being. Um, but even in those with treated, uh, with treated celiac disease, it's recognized that depression and anxiety and other mental health issues are somewhat more prevalent prevalent and that may relate to the additional stresses related to living with a chronic disease and all that entails the sense of loss of control the increasing challenges of uh, adhering to a gluten-free diet certainly for younger people the feeling of feeling picked out and different from their peers um, and, uh, all of these may add to this the stresses uh, of living living with celiac disease uh, celiac disease also seems to be somewhat overrepresented or a little more prevalent in people with some forms of neurodiversity. It certainly seems to be a little bit more common in people with um, attention deficit disorder and maybe more common in people with autism spectrum disorder as well. Uh, and then other, uh, there are other reported associations of celiac disease with an increase, with a somewhat increased prevalence of bipolar disorder and schizophrenia, although far less common than the, the, the more uh, frequent, or, but albeit challenging, uh, mental health issues related to depression and anxiety. Um, the impact on the family is really quite significant, and one of the glaring omissions from my talk is the obvious uh, impact on the family that this may be, you know, may be a, a family disorder. So we know that 10% of first-degree relatives with celiac disease have celiac themselves, so that may ad add to the burden of care within the family, add to the um, uh, challenges, uh, um, uh, uh, challenges um, impacted on the family. Uh, this study looked in particular, the kind of more overall impacts on family life, and uh, you know, so it had some interesting findings. So, um, and uh, I know, I'm aware that some of these are gender specific and probably over generalizing, but it, in this study, they reported that mothers felt the burden, the psychological burden of having to manage the gluten free diet in their child. Uh, fathers seem to carry a degree of guilt in relation to them being to blame for the child having celiac disease because they carried a celiac susceptible gene. Now, as many of you will know, one in three or one in four of us will have a celiac susceptible gene or two, and that does not mean that your children will all go on to have celiac disease, uh, and it's certainly not a reason for feeling guilty or ashamed. Uh, both fathers and, and siblings uh, regretted the limited food choices that were inflicted upon them by living with somebody with celiac disease, both within the home and uh, when, they go, when they went out to eat. Um, but on a more positive note, some mothers reported that they felt that it, was, that, that it had led to them being more creative and innovative cooks within the family um, and actually led to uh, introduction and adoption of specific family traditions that kind of um, enhanced and strengthened family life. Uh, and siblings reported that uh, living with somebody with a chronic health condition added to their sense of empathy and hopefully uh, made them a, a more kind of empathic and sympathetic rounded individual. So not painting it as a wholly positive thing, but there may be a silver lining to the cloud of celiac disease.
Uh, and finally, I know that I'm speaking to the preaching to the converted here, but living with celiac disease uh, is not uh, a cheap um, uh, alternative. Um, uh, celiac NZ were involved in a study in 2021 that suggested that, that, that gluten-free products had, uh, on average, two and a half times the cost of non-gluten-free alternatives. And some products, particularly fairly common products like breads, could be up to five times the cost of their, their gluten-containing alternatives. As you will all know, there is a Pharmax subsidy, which is scarcely worth the electronic paper it's written on, uh, because it only will provide a, a limited uh, cost saving to a very small number of products that are available from pharmacies and with pharmacy markups. Uh, that actually means that the variety and the cost competitiveness of products is better on supermarket shelves. So I suspect that relatively few people use that Pharmax subsidy. Uh, access to other supports from a financial perspective are variable, and whilst there shouldn't be a postcode lottery, I suspect that some people manage to access child dis disability allowance or other wind supports and other people don't. Um, and clearly that effect is magnified if more than one family member has celiac disease. Now, I was going to end with a nice summary slide, but because I thought I was handing over to Andrew, I don't have one. So that, that is the end of my talk. So thank you very much for your attention.